Well, thanks everyone for being here again this week. Um, I do not anticipate this chapter taking our whole hour because it's pretty short and pretty straightforward. Um, I admit when I first saw this chapter, I was like, why do we need a whole chapter on workflow and project organizing? But having spent a little bit more time with it, I actually think it's really useful to go through this because I actually learned some stuff about how R saves things and how data is preserved that I didn't know before. So um, I guess let's get started. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. All right, so we're going to be talking about workflow and projects today. Um, so the basic premise of this chapter is that we have, at this point, learned how to do some basic analysis stuff, some basic data visualization, but perhaps we've not figured out how to get organized as people who will be returning regularly to R and R Studio. Um, maybe our files are a little disorganized. I know personally, um, before this chapter and in my previous R lives, um, my files have been all over the place and I've sometimes had trouble loading things into my workspaces. And so this chapter is based on the idea that having a well-organized system for saving projects and keeping projects in specific folders is really useful if you're going to be long-term using R. Um, so Hadley kind of has a really, I think, helpful and simple way of thinking about this, um, which is what are you saving when you're working on an R project? How are you saving it? Um, what about your analysis is real is how he uses, is what he says, um, and where does your analysis live? So um, I have to say, actually, when I started um, as an R user, I had a great instructor who didn't really use the console all that much. Um, and so I've actually never really used the console personally for R stuff. Um, but I understand that many folks do. And so it's useful to think about this particular section. Um, so, um, I mean, if you use the console and you create objects in the console, then um, they will not be preserved if you don't have them in a script. Um, and so personally, I just always like to script everything um, because the script is a long-term record of what you are going to be, um, or it's a long-term record of what you have and you can replicate it. Um, so this, I would say the console is kind of like a scratch pad and like print one plus two, here it is. But if you quit R, it's not gonna come back to you basically. Um, and so to foster this behavior of scripting and making sure you preserve everything meaningful in your scripts, Hadley suggests that you toggle on this option, which I did before class. Um, so options. I did it for the project, but I suppose you could do it for global as well. Um, restore our data into workspace. No, never. So let's apply that. And then here we are. So my environment is empty. Um, so basically, Hadley says that this is going to be annoying at first because your objects won't be loaded when you restart your project, but it will be helpful in the long term because you need to learn how to preserve all of your objects in your script. Um, I personally, I agree with this, but I also like to do a thing where um, when I start a new project, I click this little save button and I create an R data file. So I created week eight script example, R data. And that puts this into the code, into, into the console. And I copy and paste it to the bottom of my, of my script. Um, and that means that basically whenever you run the script, it automatically saves it into an R data file. So you do preserve the objects in your environment, but you don't need to, it, when you quit, if you have the same option that I just toggled off, if it's toggled off, the R data file won't automatically load. So you have the option of bringing it back in if you want, 
So I, that's how I do it. I don't think it's necessary, but it's always helpful for me to have that record just in case. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then also in this chapter, uh, Hadley gave us some great shortcuts um, for just kind of making sure that your scripts are running well and that your environment is correct. And basically this is a way for you to check yourself because if you're scared of using R and restarting it and quitting it and stuff, like I often have been, these will be scary shortcuts to use. <laughs> or if you're not totally sure about your script, then like you're afraid it's gonna break. Um, so I have started, since using this chapter, I've started using these shortcuts, um, oops, been using these shortcuts fairly often. Um, and um, actually on my laptop, there is no F10. So for Mac users with laptops like mine, it's actually a zero, not an F10. Um, so yeah, those are some things that we just went over. Um, so now we're gonna talk about directories and file paths. And so I'll show you guys um, my current, where I put all my stuff. So I'm a journalist. And so I have, I work on tons of stories all the time. Um, and actually if I did it over again, I wouldn't recommend saving to a file with a file path with spaces, but I did. Um, so I have a desktop, here's my RStudio file. And within the RStudio file, I have all of my different projects here. Um, and whenever I create a new project, so here's my R for data science class folder. Um, let's start a new project. So I will start it in a brand new working directory. And that will be as a subdirectory of my current RStudio directory. So let's do test for fun create project. So I do a few things whenever I start a new project. First off, I create a script and then I save my script. Test. I usually give everything kind of the same name at first. That's just kind of a quirk, I guess, of me. And then I set the working directory to the source file location. Um, and this is an absolute file path, which we should not put in a script, Hadley you, says. You shouldn't have to do that. When you I just do it. My, okay. my professor told <laughs> me to do this and it's kind of, I don't think it's necessary, but I just do it as okay. like a redundancy. <laughs> um, then I load tidyverse. Um, and then I do that thing where I save so the R data, put it here. And probably what I should do if I were to save this oh, is make this not an absolute file path, which we will talk about in a second. Um, but anyway, for now, this is okay. So what else? Um, and then I'll like load a CSV. Let's maybe do this one. And so when you're doing these directories, you wanna make sure that everything is in the same folder and that's how it's possible to make uh, sure that your script contains relative rather than absolute file paths. So if I were taking that, this spreadsheet, the jail populations by county from here, I would have to read it in with its absolute file path, which is this. I think this will work, let's see. This is not what we want though. Oh, no, we can't even read it in that way. But basically, I guess maybe a better way of doing this would be, let's read this in with its absolute file path here. So I can technically do this. Oh, 
oh, it's because it's not, I'm not putting in the actual name of the file. Sorry, guys. Um, there we go. So here's the absolute file path of this file, which takes us all the way back to my like entire file organizing system on my computer. So what we should be doing is not this, because if we share our R folder with somebody else, they won't be able to replicate it and it'll break. So let's instead read it this way. And this is a relative file path and it's within the source, it's within the project folder. So if you share it with somebody else, it won't break because it'll be a relative path within somebody else's file system. Um, let me know if you have any questions at this point. This was something that like, it took me a second to understand, to be honest with you. I'm also not like a programmer. So a lot of concepts are difficult for me to grasp at first. Um, and then I'm trying to think of what else. So yeah, there's like other kind of things that Hadley talks about with paths and directories that I think are really interesting. I did not know that with Windows backslash was the file path. That you had to use. So I guess just be careful of that and use the forward slash and R whenever you can. Um, and then, yeah, I noticed this little squiggly points to the home directory. Um, yeah, if you can keep everything, I mean, for me, I really appreciate the fact that all of my projects are just in one big folder for our studio. Um, and trying to think of what else is useful for this presentation. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like we covered most things, but also I want to make sure that I didn't miss anything or John, is there anything else that I should talk about as associated with this project or with this chapter? Um, well, I would say, you know, be careful with that, the, the saving the R data object that, you know, your little hack. Um, mm -hmm. Because part of the, the idea is make sure that your code actually explicitly is saving things so you don't like lose track of things. But, you know, as you're getting used to that, having a backup is not an awful idea. Um, mm -hmm. That it, it is a hard thing to get used to. Like by default, our studio saves your session so that the next time you open our studio, everything's still there. And they advise, don't, don't actually do the thing that happens by default because it, it's a bad habit to get into. One time our studio crashes and oops, all your stuff is gone that you've been just regenerating each time you open our studio. So um, it's it's a hard thing to kind of accept. It's like, but it does it automatically, but you get burnt by it one time and you'll go, okay, I guess I should explicitly save everything and know where it is. Um, I guess another thing kind of related to this chapter is um, Jenny Bryan is one of the programmers at our studio, and um, she famously says that she will set your laptop on fire if you send her um, files that have, like, set WD at the top, and that, or especially if you're, like, deleting files or, change, you know, doing things that will mess with her computer in ways that are different than your computer. Just don't do that make everything rel uh, relative. relative and so there's a um hex sticker that goes around on twitter that you like someone sent me a copy i don't actually i don't think i have it here uh but it's uh a picture of a laptop set on fire and it's like um everything i, I know i learned from jenny bryan or something like that <laughs> and so anyway um but yes relative paths it's hard to get used to it's hard to think about like it's not something you normally think but a lot of times if you're working in an R you're going to end up sharing your code with someone and they don't have the same file system you do um they don't you know they might save it into a downloads folder or into their own R studio folder or whatever um trying to think what else uh that is pretty much it. I don't know. Did anyone have any questions about this? I was, John, I was going to add to Susie's comment uh, or, or the uh, 
the uh, person that was saying light the computer on fire uh, <laughs> in one of the presentations uh, or one of the, the chapters we had covered, there's a statement about uh, uh, loading libraries on a script. So install packages that that's right. actually a taboo thing. You shouldn't control somebody else's computer with that. Um, oftentimes you'll see that same line of text of install package being uh, uh, commented out. So if you have to, to install the package, you can just uncomment it and then load that library onto your machine. The uh, another the second well, just sorry, on sorry. that, a, a a really nice thing is um, when you open a script in our studio, if it sees a library for a package that you don't have, it'll say at the top, "Do you want to install whatever that package is?" And so our studio helps you take care of that. It, within the last couple of versions, they do that at least. Is that a uh, it? Uh, I don't think we've gotten into the topic yet, but that's your, uh, there's another file. Uh, like if you download uh, dev tools from GitHub, it'll actually install the packages for you. Uh, there's a way of, of uh, encapsulating your current environment for somebody else to also render as well. Uh, yeah, we're not going to get into that in this book. And that's okay. even, that's outside of um, our end, I think is the latest, uh, latest and greatest version of that. Okay. Um, yeah, that is a way that you can set up an R Studio project where it like tracks what packages are used, and then within the project, it just kind of contains the packages, including versions, which can be super helpful. We don't get into it in this book because this book was written before that existed, and that's that's actually a, a bad habit I have. It's I haven't really started working with RN, and everyone says it's a uh, lifesaver because if something changes from version to version our end takes care of that because the version that you wrote everything in is the version that people will be using for when they run your code um so yeah that is a thing that isn't here yet and i it, like i have the dubious advice of yeah everyone should learn to use our end i haven't but everyone else should do that um and I probably should too. Can we do a bonus RN class at the end of this book club? Yeah, um, some at the end or somewhere in it, like one of these days. In it. Yeah, uh, it like it probably would be. That's a good point. That in the future, having a little thing about RN here would probably make sense, um, especially since it's such a short section. But I'm not ready to do that because I haven't actually worked with it. Um, I, I, I had think to... it, it just my understanding is it's really straightforward and that's why everyone loves it. I think it can bloat your um, like your file system because you'll have little like versioned um, copies of packages included in your analyses. Mm -hmm. um, but most packages are tiny, so whatever. <laughs> I had to I discovered the R environment uh, with Twitter API. So if you if you go the R tweet route, uh, it was part of the Tiny Tuesday concept. But uh, what I found was that it uh, saves your your API key, uh, your user key to that R environment, and you have to go migrate or move that if you need to change from one device to another. The second statement I was going to make to Susie, and and that's actually a really good comment uh, about the uh, the back backslash versus forward slash, uh, depending on the OS that you're you're working on. Um, I'm finding that uh, when I move from one machine to the other, uh, that if you have the desktop version of our studio versus the web version of our studio, uh, there's a there's a slight nuance that you have to take into account when you're uh, uh, migrating code from one machine to another, and that uh, different operating system forward slash backslash. Uh, there's a statement, and if you don't mind, uh, Susie, if you're still sharing your screen, scroll up just a bit. And it's talking about the, uh, I think it was item number two on one of these lists, uh, the forward slash backslash, the double backslash. Uh, so double backslash and triple backslash actually implies different uh, uh, namespace variable calls within different environments, like your web calls, uh, Samba, uh, uh, file storage type mechanisms. Uh, John, I don't know if you want to expand on that topic at all. Uh, just... It is another reason that absolute paths can be bad. 
um, because that's that top of the path is going to be different. Like even on different Windows machines or different whatever different machines, it could have a different route that you're pointing towards. Um, you know, a C drive versus a D drive or whatever. One thing on the slashes is, is you know, Windows can use forward slash, so just use forward slash, and yeah. everyone's happy. <laughs> that's kind of what I was gonna say. It looks <laughs> yep. like you can just use forward slash no matter what. So just yep. don't. But if you're copying a file path from somewhere, it might. Right. Yeah. You, so you just have to switch it. Um, there is a function normalize path that will, like it has some arguments. I can't remember all the details about it, but it helps you make the paths pretty. Um, normally, you probably don't need to mess with that in normal work, but sometimes in packages that deal with paths, I've written things that normalize it and make sure that it's always the same, no matter what system it's on. Um, or rather, make sure that it makes sense to the system that it's on, because the normalized path will do some things to um, normalize things. <laughs> and then there's a package FS for file system that also deals with a lot of this stuff, because it's a pain. Um, Ooh, what's the here here package? Ah, yes. So, you know, yeah, it's yeah, uh, so you you can use here here in an FS package actually for for file management, and it's my favorite. Actually, <laughs> it's really nice, especially with R Markdown, because R Markdown will do relative paths relative to where the R Markdown file is saved, which might be somewhere inside of your project. Whereas here, here does it from the root of your project, no matter where it's being called from. And so, um, yeah, it's it's really handy to like make sure you're not surprised by things, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, so in other words, with here, here, you can directly go into the file without uh, providing the, the little yeah. part because it knows it works from the, from the root file from a gecko. It's really, really useful. Well, um, you can even, uh, um, it, it works perfectly if you settle um, um, a folder. So you link here, here with a folder because it's easier for uh, the function to find the folder than the, just the file name. So you usually, it's better for you to, to link it on a, on a folder. You just name a folder as a directory of your file, and then it would be easier for, for the function to find it. All right. Um, um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so regarding the workflow, workflow um, so for example, if I want to create um, R Markdown, so when I create first, create R Markdown, it will prompt me to um, edit not the name of the file, but rather to create the um, title of the R Markdown. And when I click on OK, then I need to save the document again with the name of the is there any workflow that I will just, I mean, <laughs> create, save the name of the R Markdown first directly without having to create, name the R Markdown? Is there any workflow like that? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, it depends on like the purpose of the R Markdown. There are things within yeah, exactly. the, the use this package. So that's a very useful one. I'll type that out. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you use, use okay. this is a package actually by uh, Jenny Bryan is the lead author yeah. of that, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's all kinds of things to help you um, like manage projects or um, create packages or different things. And so mm -hmm. it'll have a function in there. I you know um, there's when you're writing a package, there's a special type of R markdown called a vignette. And so you can say, use this, use vignette. And there you can specify just the name and it'll use the name to set the title. Um, just as an example, that's a, you know, it's a specific kind of R markdown. I think there mm -hmm. are probably some other ones in there that I'm not thinking of right now. 
that would be other kinds of R Markdown that it'll help you create. Um, they are slightly different, the title versus the file name. So I can see, you know, why it is a, it's separate, but it would be kind of nice if, if our studio made that a little yeah. cleaner. Mm -hmm. All right. I have a, I guess, two general questions. So Susie, that save image or save that image thing that you were putting at the very end. So what exactly did that do? I, I feel like I missed that. So John probably doesn't want me to go more <laughs> into that. Um, basically, <laughs> so I'll I, tell you I, what it does though. Okay. Um, it's so rather than restoring my workspace image when I automatically start a project, Okay. So that putting that at the bottom of the script just saves all my objects when, from a script into an R data file mm -hmm. that I can then open if I want. It's like an optional R data file that's stored. So I can bring the objects back if I need them, but it's not automatic. So it's kind of me trying to have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> mm, got it. Okay. I mean, it's better than, you know, better than losing it. And it's better than the automatic auto, you know, refresh my whole session whenever I really open our studio. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, definitely advise getting in the habit of saving individual objects that you care about yeah. and then reading in those in individual objects. I think um, for me, sorry, um, as like a person who does journalism and stuff like that, like I'm just scared of <laughs> if I have something you know, that I really want to keep I re and, and I know that I did it right and I can, you know, I just, I'm afraid of losing it forever. So it's kind of an intermediate thing, but yeah. John is right that it should just all be in script. So, so yeah, as long as you're doing it as kind of a backup, then mm -hmm. I wouldn't be uh, totally against the idea, but I would say also get in the habit of saving yeah. out the individual things that you care about and loading them in when you care, you know, totally. whenever you use them. Um, but yeah, I yeah. totally get that. Oh, that leads leads me to <laughs> when we're on the or on the subject of useful hacks. Um, let me make sure I'm typing it right. So there is this thing in R. I don't remember if we've talked about this before. Dot last dot value. That what that is, the value of that is whatever you have printed most recently into your console in R. And so sometimes like I'll run something and I'm not actually assigning it to a variable. I'm just doing some filter or whatever. I'm like, oh, this is going to be real quick. I'll just do this and see what it is. And then like 15 minutes later, it completes doing whatever it was doing. And I'm like, oh, crap. I don't, I didn't actually save that as a variable, but clearly I don't want to run that again. You can just say, you know, my, my variable gets that last that value. And then in your script, you change it from just being a pipeline with nothing assigned to assign that to that variable that I want. Um, it's a good way, like, it's another one of those of, like, I don't advise intentionally using it, <laughs> but there are times when you're like, oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> I should have saved that. So um, very useful to know uh, about it. Took a it was a while into using R before someone told me about dot last dot value. And it's very useful. John, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, do you advise what I do, which is like almost never use the console and always use the script? Yeah, well, so I use the console a fair amount and almost always I'm like, why didn't I put that in my script? So I think that is something that I would like to get in the habit of. <laughs> um, and even, even more so, like we're it'll it'll be a while before we get to it, but getting in the habit of using our markdown, um, which is where you can blend together R and text. Um, yeah, or which, Jupiter, which is what I use, but maybe I should use our markdown, not Jupiter. Uh, uh, Jupiter has a whole thing about order of execution that can be mm. weird, and our markdown is smarter about that so in that way i prefer our markdown plus i'm just an, an r junkie so <laughs> anything if that's you don't mind me yeah if you don't mind me commenting on Susie's jupiter notebook workflow so the the one thing that i'll i'll try to figure out or 
what I what I've discovered anyway. Using Jupyter Notebook is great. It's awesome. It it kind of has this awesome you know work uh, not workflow but like paradigm of of use. Then I realize crap. It's a JSON file. Like it's almost nearly impossible to to go back or share. Uh, so if you send a Jupyter Notebook without using the Jupyter Jupyter Notebook paradigm to another user that is trying to open that same notebook, you're going to run into a whole bunch of package issues and some weird other crazy things that occur. In our studio, the R Markdown environment is more uh, package centric. So it's able for another user to replicate your code easier. Um, I don't, I'm not saying not to use Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I, I would say that it has a place within the data science world of, of being able to process information or even just, you know, the whole uh, 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 documents. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's the graphics of grammar. What's the, the D3JS, the uh, data, data driven documents. That's it. Um, Jupyter Notebook is great for that. Uh, uh, as an example, if you switch and want to go a different route into uh, our studio, you're going to have a, a better reliance on packages or, or the system is going to ensure that you're going to uh, be confident in, in whatever it is you're writing. Does that make sense? I really like that you're using it. That's why I, I wanted to add that comment in. No, I'm, I'm using it because my team um, at the Chronicle we use Jupyter Notebook to share findings and whatnot. And that's partly because one of my team members uses Python. So just to kind of streamline, because Jupyter works with both, it's kind of nice, but yeah, it's good to know. Our Markdown you... actually works with both too, but really? uh, yeah. Cool. I... Maybe I should get because well, you... most of my team uses R. We only have one Python user. Oh. So maybe well, I should get everybody to switch. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anyone who primarily writes Python and does so in our studio, but you can. Like our studio has everything built around, and they're doing more and more for Python in our studio. Obviously, the name kind of throws you off because it's called our studio, and it's more built for R than it is for uh, mm -hmm. Python. But Jupyter is more built for Python than it is for R, so. If most of your team's using R, I, you might want to try uh, uh, our studio. It is funny that you know I think of Jupiter like people use it for Python a lot, and then sometimes a little bit use it for R or Julia, which is the Jew in Jupiter. Mm -hmm. That it's it was meant to be Julia Python R Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I I prefer our studio personally. Um, I don't write Python, so I don't know how much of a pain it is for Python. I don't know if it has, I don't think it has like the built-in help for Python, so, but, um, yeah, <laughs> worth looking there into. Is, um, there is a package um, uh, named Reticulate, yeah. and you can use it with um, within R and uh, making um, uh, the um, Python language inside the R Markdown. So when you click the the little arrow for uh, choosing the the language to to use in R Markdown, you can use Python as well for programming. Um, yeah. So, uh, John, I want to ask question. And so, um, what? In our studio, um, because we are talking about project, we have interrupt R, terminate R, restart R. What are these three individual does interrupt R, terminate R, and restart R? I know restart R to restart everything, but I'm not sure what interrupt R and terminate R does. So interrupt R would be if you are running something and you want to stop it from running. It's the equivalent to the stop sign button that shows up. Okay, While okay. Is running. Not 100% certain what the different, like what terminate would be in this context. Um, because I, I think terminate is aiming at kind of interrupt and restart, I think. Yeah, you, you're right. I think it's, um, it's a, another way of refreshing and killing everything and refreshing yeah. that. And then the terminate may, may not necessarily refresh. It's just terminating 
um, a particular chunk of code that you are currently running. Yeah, just the difference between interrupt R and terminate R, I'm not, I'm really not sure. I uh, don't know that I've ever used those from that menu. So um, I don't know. Uh, restart R, I use not a lot, but uh, that one I definitely use because if you want to like make sure everything is like it'll be for somebody else. And so you can mm -hmm. restart your session yeah. and it will unload any, you know, the packages won't be loaded anymore and things like that. So you can make sure it actually uh, works <laughs> because sometimes it'll seem like it's going to work and you realize that you forgot a library mm -hmm. of some package or something. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing that um, I find useful now in R that I don't need to... Uh, have all these command, command control plus shift plus F10 is command palette in R. Um, um, command palette um, in R studio, you use um, um, command shift and P where it will show you everything you can create like create markdown. Um, so I think it's useful future um, now uh, uh, that we can use command palette like VS code is very useful, yeah. So I like this one now, uh, yeah. So you can easily do everything you like, create file, you know, save everything, every command you can execute from the menu bar of our studio, you can do that. Cool. Yeah, in, in other words, you don't have to remember shortcuts anymore. Yeah. You remember <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I have a general question for for everyone. So, um, does everyone save projects similar to what Susie does? So, you know, everything within the R folder. I'm just thinking of ideas as to how other people organize their things. Um, the way that I usually do it is because I have projects and there's a lot of other experimental data. And then my analysis also goes in the folder for that specific project. So it's not like, you know, all of my R is in one space. And um, do, does anyone have any suggestions as to, you know, what is a good way of organizing? I would say not, not really, like what, whatever works for you okay. to a degree. Um, mm -hmm. You like you know it can definitely be overwhelming to have one folder that has a billion things in it. So there you know there are arguments for subdividing if it makes sense to subdivide. Um, yeah, <laughs> whatever makes sense okay, for your okay. system. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's sort of like um, when you look at those videos of organizational tips, and then you're like, oh yeah, you know, well I like that, or you know that would work for me. So just in general, I I think that Susie's way would work really well as well. Um, it's just that in my mind, I keep track of my projects in a different sort of structure. And so I want my, like whatever's on my computer to match whatever's in my in my head. So yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he really gets into, I would say it is worthwhile to spend some time thinking about naming things like mm -hmm. have a systematic way that you name things. So whether you're using subfolders or not, like if you have basically the first part of the file name could or, or of the directory could effectively be the, a subfolder, like mm -hmm. if it's a type of project or something. Um, and getting like getting a consistent pattern that you use, whether it doesn't have to be the same as anyone else, um, but being consistent will help you find it. And so like, I, and I think this is actually opposite of what Jenny Bryan recommends, but I use um, like hyphens to separate pieces of meaning and underscores to mean spaces. So like, I oh, might, so, yeah, yeah. And I it, the reason for that is then if at some point I need to like systematically go through a bunch of things, um, you know, programmatically, if I have this very consistent pattern, then I can 
write code that can understand that pattern and can break out the pieces of meaning in the mm -hmm. file name or things mm -hmm. like that. Um, right. so yeah, that's one thing that I do. And yes, oh, and there we go. There's Jenny's deck about naming things. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. That's useful. Yeah, it has some really good tips in there. Um, one thing that I'm always obsessive about is whenever you use or you include a date in any file name or anything, mm -hmm. do it in the, you know, ignore the Europe and America argument. It's year, month, day. It's the proper way to name a date because then they alphabetize properly. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. That makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, if you've got, let me type it in, like, uh, uh, personally, yeah. I have my 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 files uh, organized like if I have projects or single files differently. So I have projects and files inside because a project might include different uh, uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. So inside a project, um, there are a few other folders. And then there will be the, like single folders with inside just scripts, or may you want to, you may want to have a, a folder for data, like CSV mm -hmm. files, uh, um, um, or whatever is table data uh, you have, and then you have another folder named script. You have all your scripts inside another folder, so you have like um, uh, everything organized, you, you know that when you need a da uh, table, you can link to the folder named data and you have mm -hmm. all, all your data inside. Uh, or otherwise, if you source a script, you might want to source the script from, from a, a folder named scripts. Mm -hmm. It like it's like uh, have boxes inside boxes and everything to, to have uh, uh, everything organized. It's, it's, um, it's not always uh, um, so, so. It depends what, where where you're going, what what are you doing, and everything. But uh, it's better to have everything separate. Because otherwise, it's easily, for example, when I do study Tuesdays, for example, mm -hmm. sometimes I do many tries and I always start with one file in Markdown and name it like week 36 and the name of the, the topic, the week topic. Mm -hmm. And then I start making single scripts because I make mm -hmm. tries and everything. So it's always a good uh, option to have everything separate to do not like lose the manner of the thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Federica. Yeah, that's that's actually helpful. I think that there's, you know, like um, for the specific type of analysis that I've been doing, usually follow a certain pattern. So there is already like established conventions within this field. You know, you have generally like your raw data, your aligned data, and then all of the analysis that follows. So I think that that actually makes sense. I, I should just look more into it because I, I think I've been a little bit, um, uh, not paying attention and then my folder is getting super crowded with everything just, you know, in one mm -hmm. large thing. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, looking yeah. for suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. So I think also one interesting thing here, I shared um, chapter two, project oriented workflow from what they forgot to teach you about R from Jenny Bryan. It really mm. does, uh, she really does a good job. Um, where she explained how to even structure your project, the folder organization. Um, so this is a good read, I guess. Um, it explained um, how you can do the organization very well as well. Great, thank Maybe you. Maybe you can have another. Yeah, no worries. Is it okay if I ask my um, wrangling question? Yes. Okay, so I have, um, I think it's 11 different data frames. They're all, um, the end row is all different, all of different lengths. I need to combine them by row. So the rows that are similar or same across all of them. But say that um, for the ones that where the, a certain row doesn't exist, I needed to fill in zeros. So 
how would I do that? So what I was thinking is I'll take the data frame that has the most rows because it contains everything that the other ones would, right? And then try and bind columns from the other ones into this one. But that's that's exactly what I need. So if a, if a specific row doesn't exist in one of them, I need it to put in zero values. So you're probably going to want to start with a left join. Okay. Um, to start with your big one and then left join mm -hmm. the other things into them on whatever they have in common. Assuming this, okay. wait, do they have something in common? Yeah, you, some okay. other rows will be in common for sure. So, yeah. so ha using some key to join them together, that way you okay. get a row for whatever you started with. Like all those rows get preserved. Okay. And then um, what is the function? So what that'll do is in all the fields that don't exist, you'll get NA. Okay. And if you, okay. um, from there, you can use, uh, what is it? Tidy R replace NA. Okay. And you could have it replace with zero. So you would have to do some um, some work from there. And if, if you're not oh, able yeah. to get it from there, uh, that is one that seeing the code would help a lot. So if you can put it into the Slack, I'm sure we can get someone to help you out. Okay, I, I will do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think that the, the problem I might see with the replace NA, wait, let me think. Uh, replace oh, NA. Or otherwise you can like, if you can select the rows with NA, you can just like um, do the um, um, table name and uh, say is not and the and the table and the, okay. the table name and then you see where it's a logic um, uh, result so you have false and true okay you have false when they they are um, uh, not not values uh, and true when they uh, then, then you can just uh, assign a value to the to this uh, uh, to this thing, but you need to like uh, have square bracket and repeat the the table name like is now again, but inside the square bracket um, in a way that you can extract the value not in a logic. Uh, way, but mm -hmm. you have exactly the, the na appearing on your screen. Okay. And then you assign it to zero. Mm -hmm. so I, I show you, if you want to, I show you um, um, a way to do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see the the R. See if you have uh, a, a data frame, and you say like, uh, you know, uh, equal to I don't. Um, Okay, uh, here it's just a colon. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you see it? It's a, yes. It's X and you have one, two. Then if you want to, I, I assign the data frame to uh, my DF. Um, just add another column to, to have that a bit more like, like this. And I have my DF this way. Mm -hmm. And if I do is not my DF, mm -hmm. I have a logical um, result. But if I do my DF, uh, let's say my DF, and then square bracket mm -hmm. this way, if I 
choose a colon, let's say the, the second colon, uh, it extracts the, the second column, no? Because these are the rows and these are the column. Mm -hmm. So this way I go inside my table. Got it, the yeah. Square okay. Bra okay. If I do mm -hmm. is now, my df, oh. I, it extracts uh, exactly the now values of my df. Then I, I assign this to zero. Okay, mm -hmm. and then when I recall my df, I have the zeros. Oh, got it. Okay, great. Yeah. So basically, you have the table, and then mm -hmm. you open the square brackets, mm -hmm. because this way you can access the values inside the, the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what do you want? Of uh, what, which part of the table do you want? I want na values, okay? So I right. do is right. na, and I repeat the name of, of the table because I can even select a column or a row and everything. But in this condition, I just want to set up all the table with the, the na value and assign them to zero. So I repeat yeah. My, yeah. my df this way, and I have, uh, okay. Uh, it's already done. So this way Perfect. you have, hopefully I uh, answered the question. Awesome, thank you, Federica. Yeah, that helps. And thank you for walking me through that. Um, sure. I think that's, that should work actually. I, Cause I was thinking like, if my data frames already contain NA values and I wouldn't necessarily, but I think that they all contain zeros. So NA will, will work in this case. So great. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Um, okay. um, the tidy way um, is replace NA. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think um, maybe with this link, if you look at the uh, replace NA, um, the tidy way, you will see how it can work in that. Sense. Okay. Uh, yeah. Got Something it. Like and you, you, it may happen that you have no no values, but empty, empty mm -hmm. cells. I mm -hmm. don't know if is this the case. Is this the case that you have em empty cells instead of having like na written clearly or none? I don't think that there will be empty cells. I guess it'll depend oh, on how the how the join does things. So like John oh, said, if it easy. just fills with NA, yeah, that's going to work. That so, would be yeah. easy. Otherwise, there is another way to extract the the, the rows or, or the, the cells, which are like literally empty, not by this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I, I guess, can I ask just one last question? And this is, would be just general learning. Um, how do you guys do to like, you know, learn all of the syntax and like the language? Cause I'm very lazy for this and I'm like, there's Google. So someone must have done the thing, you know, <laughs> that I want. So I type in a question and then code appears. And then I'm like, I'll copy paste that and, you know, check this, <laughs> make sure that it's work working. But I'm like, I don't want to memorize it. <laughs> <laughs> so, a friend told me, you know, you just got to practice. I know that that is true, but I'm like, the Google is there. So, <laughs> uh, basically that a lot, but, um, okay. making sure to actually read the code. So to make sure I understand what it's doing, um, that would be the one step that, and that's, that is why I really advise, you know, learning to to put words onto all the code so that you can read it because otherwise it's easy to gloss just you know glaze over and not really see what it's doing if you if it if you can't read it in words like yeah so. yeah 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 for sure i can read it and so you know oftentimes we'll go on to stack exchange or or whatever that it is called and uh, there's several ways right of, of doing something right and so i will actually use the one that i understand right, logically <laughs> right. and in words because other things i'm like i don't know what that does um but if someone told me okay now you write it from memory i'm just like i don't know you know where the semicolon went or you know like uh where the function 
etc. So I, I think that that's just what I'm struggling with. I don't know if it's just me not wanting to actually memorize things or, or what it is, but yeah, any suggestions are, are helpful as to how you guys did it. <laughs> thanks, Susie. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, my suggestion is like just practice. Um, yeah. I'm in the okay. same boat. I'm in the so uh, in the same boat when I first joined the this community. I was seeing mm -hmm. people like they just when I you ask questions, they would just answer you anything. Yes. But one thing for sure that there is no substitute for it. It just practice. Mm, when I started okay. doing a project like, I mean, Tidy Tuesday and some project I have because like I was working on Python and basically my supervisor uh, just forced me to do R and because he knows mm -hmm. R and mm -hmm. I know Python. So I had to learn R and yeah. when I come like the syntax is a bit difficult, but um, what forced me is just doing two projects. When I did those two projects because of the lens, like one month or two months, I did those projects every day I'm doing R. Every so mm -hmm. it just become oh I just learned to you all those stuff and when I don't know how to do these things I just I know where to go to pick right. that thing to yeah but previously when I don't know I don't even know where to find it like uh, in the R Studio website or some stuff like that but now when I have problem I know directly where I should go and find the solution <laughs> so my 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 answer is no substitute to practice. Okay. Only practice okay. in the solution. <laughs> I mean, to get this thing <laughs> on top of your head. Yeah. Unless if you um, <laughs> become um, a friend with the Google, which is also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think, yeah, maybe um, I, I just need to, to keep doing it. So I've, I've actually been practicing quite a bit with R, um, which is good. And uh, I'm learning, I think, more of the, like, the capabilities and what our general concepts. So I'm just going to keep practicing. Then, so. Yep. That's, that's all you can do. <laughs> eventually, no, hear, but... eventually it'll stick and not everything okay. will like eventually the things you do a lot and you find mm -hmm. interesting yes. will stick mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else will just, you know, whatever you don't yeah. have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. But definitely read it. <laughs> It's easy to just copy paste without really paying attention to what you're copy pasting, and no, yeah, for sure. I yeah. I ran into into something like that where I did a matrix transpose once, and then I didn't understand why something was the way that it was until I noticed that there was a little t, and I was like, I should have paid attention to it. And it <laughs> took me a while to yeah to figure that one out. So now I always read and understand, and only use the code that I understand. But I can't produce it myself, is what I'm saying. I guess from memory. Yeah, like what and Federica I guess, did, right? Yeah, so I'm like, I'm amazed, Federica, that you can just, you know, do that and put all the parentheses in the right place, you know, from memory. <laughs> so I think that's great. It took a little practice so, Got it. <laughs> to, to have this this knowledge. But yeah. um, another suggestion I can, can uh, give uh, to you is that when if if R for any reason release an error, mm -hmm. and this is a suggestion that many videos, many tutorials uh, give to you. Uh, you. You just need to copy the the result of your error. So yes, what yes. are saying to yeah. you and just yeah. paste it uh, on Google. Yeah. And then it works actually <laughs> and you find the answer. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of my my regular Googling, pasting, couple <laughs> pasting errors and then <laughs> <laughs> what the problem yeah. was so perfect yeah. also, also um, one good thing like um, I read one blog post by Kevin he was saying mm -hmm. um, doing Tidy Tuesday it gives you practice not only that limit to the scope of what you are doing but mm -hmm. you have different mm -hmm. kind of data set so you would have different kind of um, uh, uh, I mean, domain, different way to manipulate data, you will understand different way how to deal with different data from different domains. So it's not like you are doing the same verbs today you will do in the next study today. So you may be changing different verbs as you go along doing practice in Teddy Tuesday. That mm -hmm. also will go along to you that um, you can actually um, learn um, a lot of different um, scope that is not within your reach. 
Right, right. Yeah, I, I definitely should look into that. I've just been busy learning things that I, you know, just work related. So, but <laughs> yeah. thank you. Yeah, these tips are all very helpful and encouraging. All right. Well, that took us just over the hour. So uh, I think that'll do. Um, I can't remember who someone said they, oh, Lucy, who isn't here, I think, said they're going to do it next week. Oh, you are? Nope. Nope. Not here. Okay. Um, so hopefully she's still up for that. We will check in the channel to make sure. I will be on the road. Um, I might call in. We'll see. Uh, but in any case, uh, yeah, thank you. That was great. And it was a great conversation. And now I need to go see what that YAR thing is about that you had open in a tab. <laughs> oh, the pirate R. It's amazing. I love that website. <laughs> <laughs> I, it caught my eye because it looks like a funny, funny way it's of looking great. at things. I can, uh, I'll copy paste it really quick. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone.